is an okay and an ordinary thing to want to do and to feel relaxed doing it, that is absolutely fine. Um, why there is this big thing where you have to go to college, you have to go and get educated. And, you know, I've known of people, and I'm sure it's the same with you because the world of learning disability is quite small um, and you see the same people all the time. But I've known of people do like a maths class for the last 25 years. And I said to one of these guys who had quite good mental capacity, I was like, why do you still come here? Like, you're, you're super brilliant at maths now. You've done, it, you've done it for 25 years. And he agreed. And he said, the reason I do it is because it's a good social life. Like, he just wanted to see his friends. But whether they, they didn't, but what they, the big thing out of it, he said, I don't actually enjoy the class. <laughs> I just like coming because <laughs> my friends are here. And I get that. Like, there's not enough social stuff around. And, and that so often is the thing. But I do also, I do also see how they're enticed into doing education stuff right up until, I don't know, the age of 50 sometimes. And you're thinking like, surely there's more to life than just needing this, us ourselves, I'm sure we all get to a point where we feel like, you know what, I'm maxed out on that now. I need to go away and do something else, have some fun or, or whatever. But how do you deal with that when you have that sometimes when a social worker comes in, Mark, and they're like, they sit someone down um, and they kind of give it to you. I, I know they always use that terminology, which I really dislike. Um, was it access to the community? <laughs> and I always say, what you mean going out the door? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what are we talking? How do you get past that, uh, Mark? Are you are you a little bit like me in that way, where you feel like you've got to re-educate them, or or how do you how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm obviously happy to challenge social workers, and I don't know, I'm one of these people that if I lose my job because I've stood up for somebody, <laughs> then you know, I really don't care. I'll just go yeah. down the road, and you know, I'd be happy. <laughs> stuck in a shelf for the rest of my life knowing that I lost my job for the right thing mm -hmm. and you know we've got people that go to day centres and I'm like can we not you know the money you're spending on that day centre can we not have in something else and that's something more meaningful for that person mm -hmm. but yeah you're right it's like blocks of what they can and can't do and yeah I've got guys that go to day centres and they do nothing all day other than you know watch TV like there's nothing educational about it there's no structure and I kind of think that money could be spent on so much more, so much, you mm. know, support, but they don't, they're kind of very, the council are tick box very much. Um, I think, you know, over the last few years, I've noticed that definitely one-to-one -one hours, so, you know, that time when somebody gets a sole care just for themselves is reduced and reduced to the point where mm. they, they have like four hours a week and, you know, what, what are you going to do in four hours? You might be able to take some cinema or bowling or, you know, but you can't really do, you can't go out for the day, really. I mean, I'm very lucky that that my directors are very supportive and, you know, we kind of overrule kind of the one-to-one -one and we put it in place if we think that residents benefit from it and they need it. Or That's good, you know. that's good. Um, but there's so many care companies out there that wouldn't, and I kind of, I do worry about the mental health of those residents. And I kind of think, well, if my directors changed or if the company got bought out and, you know, all of a sudden it was, no, you're only doing the one-to-one, -one. you know, I've got guys that go out for like 40, 50 hours a week and they would go to like 10 and I think there's no way they would they would survive they would end up going stir crazy in that house but I know I've spoken to a number of social workers and you know I've been to meetings and they're talking about in learning disability homes definitely of getting rid of the one-to-one -one. Right. they're saying that care homes should just be able to provide all the care in-house and there shouldn't be this need of going to the cinema all the time and going bowling if they want to it should be a group activity which <laughs> it's crazy you know I get that yeah most of the time you would go bowling in a group you know nobody wants to go bowling on their own but like to the cinema like I go to the cinema with my partner but you know I don't necessarily go with a group of 13 other people like descend on a cinema but yeah I, I don't know I don't know where social care is going and I hope that somewhere along the line it, it sounds like it's going backwards uh, if anything because you know when person centre planning come in i know it was kind of the buzz thing for a long time um it, it certainly was with with my company for a long time it never was really you know it was always something they were doing practical but it wasn't something we were capturing and stuff like that but everything was about individualization going out now more one-to-one -one, and you know I used to dread seeing buses pull up sometimes. You see these ridiculous small buses and then about, I don't know, 
30 people get out of it and you're like hang on where are all they going oh they're all going to to one place they all agreed to go there then did they you know it just it just you just think like out of that lot how how is this happening but you know i think to go back to that i mean it just goes to show you where how lost they are i think and you know it's worth probably i mean i'm trying to get someone on here no one's no one's stepping up at the moment on my podcast i've had one person reply that's a possible but they wanted me to tell them the questions before i have them on and i just don't do that i just gonna have a chat so unless anybody's willing to do that then i'm not prepared to give you the questions before you come in you know it's not it's not how i am but like i'm sure there are reasonable social workers out there as well i'm not saying everybody is the same by any stretch but I think that the pressure is on them from above them sometimes to this whole cutting money and almost like if you do it, you've succeeded for the day. Um, and, and that is totally wrong for me. Like that is not the right way to be gearing uh, social workers when uh, certainly when, you know, supporting people with a learning disability that have a hard enough time of acceptance as it is without having this put on them as well. And, you know, to say that life now is basically in a care home, I mean, what's the point? Um, and, and to something else you touched on, Mark, about the, the finance of a, a day centre, here's a, a typical one. Um, so my sister, um, when when she was living with us, we, we were given um, what they call, you have like a couple of weeks um every year it's like um it's, it's kind of like a relief thing like where you know my sister could she could go into a day center for a couple of weeks and it would be paid for and all the rest of it and you're like and, and then you sit down and you work out how much that cost so to go into this day center which i visited and it wasn't overly fantastic i have to say it was mainly lots of people doing crayons and coloring a book they didn't go out they weren't very well staffed so i thought well, i'm not really sure she's going to enjoy this maybe one day uh that was going to cost in the region of like three and a half grand and i was like three and a half grand a week for this this is ridiculous like and i said to them i said like you know again i could send my sister away with her carer abroad and for half the price like and do something <laughs> quite meaningful uh, and and that for me I, I was just stunned by that and thinking how is this still around um i'm sure you've had the same the same experiences as i have part with things like that but i do question sometimes where the money is placed and whether there is enough reviewing of the current structure going on i have no idea yeah i think the sad thing is day centers aren't regulated either no. so they're not they're not governed by the CQC. Obviously, the council obviously inspect them, but I don't know how often that actually happens. But I think like what we said about earlier, that if you've got somebody running a, running a day centre that knows how to talk the talk, they're going to yeah. very easily be able to talk the talk to that person yeah, from the council. And I know what I found is that last year, all the day centres had to apply, um, definitely to Essex County Council. Um, about funding and what they can provide and some of the day centers that i know of that do generally actually do things didn't bother because they said it's just a you know a paperwork exercise and now the council won't place anybody at those day centers um yeah. so those those good ones that didn't do it they risk being shut down now because obviously there's no funding coming in but you know i've got day centers that some of my guys go to that the council fund and i just think it's a waste of money but when I've found other day centres and I've met with the managers and I've gone in and I, you know, I've spent time there, I think actually they would benefit from going here so much more. They're doing so much mm -hmm. more life skills. And they're like, mm -hmm. no, we're not swapping them. It's here or nothing. And I kind of think, well, like what you said a minute ago, those 50 people that get off that minibus, they can't all have chosen to go there because they've probably never been shown anywhere else. So they don't know anywhere yeah. else. But yeah. you can't, you can, there's no way of transferring them from anywhere because it's down to that social worker or the council yeah. to say yes or no but mm -hmm. and you have to really argue it but you then end up against a brick wall because they're like oh yeah i'll take it back to panel and you know i don't think they ever actually end at panel i think they're just mm -hmm. forgotten about and they come back and tell us no you know with, with the answers no you can't, there's no way of challenging it yeah. yeah no i agree um now just to uh before we go on to something else i wanted just to, to hit on about the leadership business and something you mentioned earlier and you know i i would say since i've gone into other industries since since my last uh being in care like i've i've really my hat's off to people that are 
home managers in in care residential care especially because it is it's such a demanding job there's so much to it um as and you know to you know the the big thing now is you know we want to see leaders we don't want to see the old generic managers just tick boxing like we said earlier we don't want to just see task being spoken about and what I mean by that is when I don't know you have a, a staff member sitting in front of you and you say to them like give me a give me a general day and they may hit on well I came in I got such and such up I did this I do that and then it's all task there's no there's nothing in there that they're telling me about you know um, I did this and this you know made all the difference to this person's day I spoke to him had a chat you know got his hopes up a bit more he was a little bit down those kind of things get missed out a lot especially if you don't have a manager in place that that kind of wants to inspire a bit of change. But one of the difficult things I think since I've moved away, Mark, that I look back on and I think, blimey, like you're almost damned if you're doing, you're damned if you don't, is that you, with managing in, especially with learning disabilities, with vulnerable people, as a manager, like you've said there, you've you've kind of put it on a plate. You've said like, look, the most vulnerable people, the people I need to look after the most, are the ones we're supporting, the ones we're providing for. But at the same time, I've got a staff team and they want to feel supported as well. And what happens, what happens, what happened with me a lot of the times was that, yes, we would be supporting the staff team. But the moment, OK, something gets raised or there's a safeguarding, we have to investigate that as professionally as possible. We want to find out everything. And when that goes on sometimes, I almost feel like some staff would maybe feel like, oh, you know what? We thought you had our back. You don't. You're not going to believe us over. Maybe even the resident themselves have spoken up. But you know as well as I do, we still have to investigate. It doesn't matter. Uh, sometimes, even if we know in the back of our minds that we have this gut feeling that nothing happened, we still have to investigate. It's just part and parcel of, of what we do, right? Um, and I feel it's those moments that is really hard then to <laughs> to explain to people outside when you're managing in a care home that you have these two different layers. One side of you, you're trying to support the staff, you're trying to coach them. And then when something comes up that you need to address and it need, has to be addressed, um, because ultimately the people that are in the home, they're your, um, dare I say, you know, they're the people that are your customers. They're the ones, they're the reason you are there. Ultimately, they are the ones from a business sense as customers. I hate using that word, but also from the level of why everybody is in the job is for the people we support. Right. And the moment there's that little bit of tension where there might have to be something to be addressed. It's very hard for staff to recognize you as the same afterwards. And that relationship almost gets it gets kind of gritty. Sometimes it gets a little bit grey with where you sit because they don't often see. Okay, so now they're gonna they're gonna literally their their focus point is on the person. They're not gonna believe me. They haven't had my back all this time, and and that happened a few times. And it was like, damn, like this is this is tough stuff. And I, I it was it was very difficult. I would say for me, I had many problems like that where I would get into that sort of um something happened um sorry i'm going off on a bit of a tandem here but let's just say something happened i had to address it with the person the staff member the staff member in turn a little bit later may think oh you know he's not the same you know that ain't gonna be the same with me and them how do you deal with that yourself mark sure somebody is a manager yourself and my hat's off to you buddy i'll tell you uh wholeheartedly it's a tough job how does, how have you managed to deal with that and what are some of the things you've learned if any that you, you've managed to sort of have that that relationship still last after after the fact yeah I mean you are right you know whereas outside of social care you'd have a human resource department you'd have an admin department you'd have obviously management you'd have whoever payroll whereas as a home manager you're kind of all of those things built into one person so yeah, you, there's, you've got to find that balance of supporting the staff and worrying about their well-being. And I'm, I'm very lucky that my deputy manager is extremely good at kind of well-being and speaking to staff. And I kind of leave her to managing that side of things, um, just because I think her background, she, you know, and what she can bring and the advice that she can offer to staff is a lot more than what I feel that I can offer. Um, but it is finding that balance between 
being their friend and being kind of a colleague on as well and being that manager because as much as you need to make sure that they're doing their job and you know holding them to a